Now we're going to discuss something that doesn't come up a lot, but it is an important construct to know how to model. That is weak entities and identifying relationships. Coming back to our company ER diagram, I want to draw your attention to the entity type dependent. Notice that it has two lines around it instead of the usual single line. Those double lines indicate that dependent is a weak entity type. And then I look at the dependence of relationship and I note that it has two lines around it as well. That's because dependence of is known as an identifying relationship. I liken a weak entity type to an elderly person who cannot stand on their own and they need a cane or a walker in order to support them. Well, dependent is a weak entity type and the rows of its table cannot stand on their own they need a strong entity type to support them. What does that mean? If we look at the attributes of dependent, we will see name, sex, birth date, and relationship. These attributes alone are probably insufficient to uniquely identify an entity in the dependent table. For example, we might have two dependents whose name is John, whose sex is male, that were born on the same day, and that they were the son of the employee. How could I distinguish one John from the other? I might need to know the, the key of the strong entity to which this is associated. So perhaps with the employee ID, I'll be able to know that John, for that employee ID, is a unique dependent. And John, for a different employee ID, would be another unique dependent. And this is why they have name partially underlined. The partial underline says that name is a partial key, that it alone is not sufficient to uniquely identify a dependent. In fact, even in combination with other fields, it is still not enough to identify a dependent of an employee. What we would need would be to use the primary key of the strong entity, employee, and that coupled with name would uniquely identify a dependent. This is why we call dependent a weak entity and we call dependence of the identifying relationship. The identifying relationship says, use this relationship to grab the primary key of the strong entity, marry that key with our partial key, and then you will have a primary key for the dependent table. And again, that dashed underline under name, that's a dashed underline, and that means it is a partial key. So when I make my dependent table, I will use the partial key of name and combine it with the employee ID for unique identification. And that's going to work really well until I hire this man pictured here. Do you know who this person is? This person is George Foreman. He's a famous boxer, and he's famous for something else as well. George Foreman named all of his sons George. So if we were to hire George Foreman to our company, we'd have a problem because now taking George Foreman's employee ID coupled with the name George, I may have four or five rows in this table for all of George Foreman's sons. So what you might be thinking is, you might be thinking, well, maybe I can combine birth date and name together to accommodate George Foreman. And then I would have to put a dashed underline underneath birth date. Except that would not be correct. 
The reason that would not be correct is the underlining of an attribute signifies that it could be a partial key, but underlining two attributes means that either one could be the partial key. So that would not work. What we would have to do in this case is we would just have to do something totally different, getting rid of both of these as they, they stand. And then we might need to have something like a composite attribute called a dependent ID. And the dependent ID consists of name, And birth date. Now this seems a little weird, but this is the way to properly diagram it. And then we would put a dashed underline under the de dependent ID. That's the proper way to model that relationship now. And so now the dependent ID becomes the partial key, but as we know, when we make the table, we're not going to include that. It's not a simple attribute. So we will still use name and we will still use birth date and relationship and sex. And we will still bring in the employee ID from the strong entity type. So I guess the motto of that story is never hire an employee who names his children with the same name. Nah, just kidding. But I want to come back to the question of the dependence of why do I need a double diamond there? I mean, I know dependent is a weak entity because it has the double lines. I see that the dependent has a partial key of name, and that means I would have to follow the relationship and grab the strong entity's key. So my dependent table will now have social security number and name. So why do I have to have the double diamond around dependence of? And the answer is simple. In this case, I guess you don't technically need it. But we make it the identifying relationship because there's always the potential for there to be multiple relationships between a dependent and other entity types. In fact, we could envision a new relationship where an employee is a mentor of someone else's dependence through some kind of corporate mentorship program. Then I would have two relationships between an employee and a dependent. I would have the dependence of relationship and I might have the mentor of relationship. So which employee ID do I need to uniquely identify a dependent? I would need the dependence of a relationship. And that's why this is a relationship that has the double diamond. And that sums up weak entities and identifying relationships. You don't come across them a lot in modeling, but sometimes you do. And it's important for us to know how to represent them in an ER diagram.